Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. We're back, we're back, we're back. <laughs> Just another quick variation on the um, personal symbols. Take a significant other, like a boyfriend far away in Japan, mm -hmm. or whatever you call them. Imagine them as a child and you as an adult. See how that goes. Imagine you as a child, them as an adult. See how that goes. Imagine both of you as children. What do you see yourself with the two of you doing? Playing Okay. Let's see how that. Imagine both of you as children and both of you as adults taking care of those children. Okay, so it's all kinds of ways. Okay. I can give you a little bit of my own kind of, if you want to say, pragmatic. Oh. Just to miss it very quickly, one of the ways you can do personalized images is take a significant other, imagine them as a child with you as an adult, imagine you as a child, them as an adult, imagine the two of you as children with two of you as adults. And it says a lot about the relationship and how you see each other. So I have my own little pragmatic unionisms. I call it the United Brain States of You. I share this with most of all my clients. I share that I, I really, in certain ways, run my own life this way. So here it is. You are the president. You are the president of the United Brain States of You. Now, it's a very interesting role. First of all, it's a lifetime role. You never have to get reelected. You never can be impeached. You are the president. That's how it goes for the entire, your entire existence. Now, you don't actually run the country. It's interesting. What your job is to do is to delegate in any given moment who's running the country. Now, the bind is, because it's really important, it's really important, who's in that Oval Office sitting at that big famous Oval Desk with their feet on the desk running the show? And sometimes it's not the part of you that the president would really optimally choose. We have a huge, the biggest department of your inner White House is the Department of Defense. We have a protector. We need to have a protector. It's a whole department. But the problem is some of the protectors, some parts of it, and oh, I should say, by the way, you can never get rid of any of the cabinet members. You can, you can hire consultants from the outside world, whether they be teachers or therapists or whatever. But the cabinet you've got, that, they're all the Senate, all that stuff, that's who it is, folks. But you can, as president, do your best to see to it that the best person for the job is running the show. But the trouble is the perverse protector comes along. Because you get scared. All of us get scared. The scared part of us comes out and goes, ah, I need help. Hmm, the protector comes. Now, protection comes in really perverse ways. Substance abuse is the perverse protector. And I know there's neurobiological aspects and genetic aspects and all that. But it's a way of trying numbing pain, trying to do all kinds of things. I mean, to get really extreme, suicide is the ultimate perverse protector. I mean, outside of choiceful, horrible disease, I'm going to, I will not allow you to have to tolerate this unbearable pain of feeling so disconnected from everything, I'll take you out of this. That's a perverse protector. So in a way, whether you want to call it shadow or whatever, they're right. What you deal with in therapy, a lot, is the protector. And in many ways, the perverse protector. It keeps us away from relationships, it does all kinds of things. But you can't get rid of it. You need to make it a consultant, just like that little two-page article I sent you about compassion, like your dissertation on compassion. You can't get, you gotta say, okay, critic, because the critic, oh man, big part of your personality. It's part of the, the defense team. I'm gonna shape you up. You gotta listen to me. You messed up. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. You can't let that part take over. Otherwise, it's like you need Jack Bauer, for those who remember 24, because your White House just got totally invaded. You like Jack Bauer. He came in and kicked ass and then freed the president again. The point is, you can't choose at any given moment who's running your inner White House. And that's your task. You want to take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself? You choose. And it's really important, I believe, to get to know who your cabinet members are. Who is? And you can describe each one of them. I have an inner creature. My God, my nickname was Fushy when I was a little pumpkin. Why? Because I didn't fuss, I fushed. Fush, push, push. I complained. So I, my inner creature is overdeveloped at times. And I've got to be aware of that because I can say, oh, wait a minute, the president. Prefrontal cortex, your wise one, whatever, can say, wait a minute. 
Who do I do I want to quetch? Come on, do I want to quetch right now? I think I told you. A couple weeks ago, I'm out. I'm the only guy out. And the waves are, I'm in a certain spot where it just keeps thrashing at me. Doesn't feel fair. The Kretcher's big on fairness. And I thought, oh, I'm moving the Kretcher. You know, I'm going to let the Kretcher, I'm going to take a full minute and totally Kretcherize. Just Kretch on. And just, ah, and do it loud, loud. You're going to Kretch? Kretch. Really Kretch. And I did. Oh, I had a great time for about a full minute. I know cortisol is flowing. I know it's not a good state. But it was fun. For, nobody's around. Like, yeah, I fun. It's so good. And then I can finally laugh at it. Now the humorous one, the light one, the bright one. It's enormously useful to see the personality as aspects, 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 aspects. And you have all of You have the wimp, you have the warrior. You have the quetcher, you have the optimist, resilient, oh my god, life is fabulous, or hey, I can deal with that. Hey, hey, the glass is a hundredth full. What are you complaining about? You have that part. Who do you want to be in this moment? And the president is the one that can say, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, come on in. You can advise me, because they all have. The critic has some advice for you. Fine. You know what? I don't even want you in this office. You text me your advice. You stay in your little office way back there. You text me your advice. But I'm not having you run this show. I'm not having you come into this office. The other big part of us, part of the Department of Defense, the slacker. Oh, God, my slacker comes in when I have to write a report. Oh, God. I'll find more ways to not write that report. Oh, my God. Oh, I got to do these emails. Legitimate. Got to do emails. Got phone calls. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'm hungry. It's lunchtime. I deserve to eat. It's important to keep. <laughs> Fuck, man. Guess what you didn't do? The report. Ah! I got one now, actually. It's like, oh, this weekend. I get, and I get paid money. You guys don't get paid money for your reports. I get paid money for this. I got to tell you, it's not worth it to me. <laughs> no, this one, fortunately, I'm happy. Because look at the main part, it sucks. I think, oh, good, maybe I won't have to write this up. It's worth it to me to refund them some money. It's worth it. I'll refund them, I don't know, I'll figure 300, maybe 400 bucks. It's worth it to me. But the other part of me, the responsible, wait a minute, you got to make a living. Well, part says, no, you know. You should write this report. You make another 400 bucks. Come on. And the other part's like, fuck, man, 95 of the right can share. You think I'm going to care about 400 bucks? Oh, God, it's not worth it to me. And besides the ethical, you know, I'm going to call his attorney. I'm going to give him the results. I've already talked to the guy. I'll do what the attorney tells me to do because it's work product of the attorney. It's not ordered by the court. Anyway, we all have the slacker. And if we start looking at ourselves and others in these ways and keep thinking, like, who's there right now? The first thing I ever said to you, or second thing after I told you you're my boss, I want to create an environment of psychological safety so that inner scholar, that inner wonder one, that inner curious one, like, how's the light? Remember I did this? How's the lighting work? That part gets evoked. That part's in that White House going, wee! Wow, this is fun. This is interesting. Oh, I want to learn. And that's why I want you to turn off your cell phones and all that, because that's a really different part of you. It's going to be absent. And I know we all falter. It's OK, because those parts don't go away. But if we can be cognizant and really get, because each one of those parts has its own value structure, its own belief systems, its own attitudes, its own personality. By the way, it's its own brain print. That's why I call it the United Brain States, because it really is a different brain. When you're in your playful part and you have an fMRI, you're in a really different place fingerprint, neuro fingerprint, then when you're quetching or when you're angry. What, it's a, and you can get to the point where you could just look at the fMRI and go, I know what state I'm in or they're in. I don't even have to see them. You just, because it's a brain state. But we get to choose. We get to choose because there's all these ways of doing that. Okay, you get the sense of this? I find it extremely useful. And it's a kind of neo Jungianism, the implicit assumption underneath all that is really very Jungian. But it's a modern way, a pragmatic way. And I use this with lots. And most people come, oh, well, that's cool. They, they get it. And they learn to say, yeah, I'm my protector, man. Boy, that came out. And they learn. And you have compassion for yourself that way. All right. <sighs> Problem solving. Erickson, Milton Erickson. Again, you've got to at least glance through Jay Haley's Uncommon Therapy, which uh, he, he followed Milton Erickson and wrote about how this guy does therapy. 
before you get your license. Just look at it. You know, just, it's amazing. Now, some of those things, you really, I don't know you can still do those things nowadays because of ethics rules. Not that he was unethical, but he, was, he thought outside the box. And he has a whole school, as you know, a whole movement of hypnotherapy. And what he used, of course, in hypnotherapy is imageries. So, I mean, examples, of that, but let me give you one simple one. A couple would come in, comes into him, because every year around Christmas, the in laws come, dad's parents come. And they, no, actually, it's mom's parents. It's the classic. Mom's parents come. And of course, they get into this marital strife thing, and it's like, ah, it sucks. So they come in. They give him that little sketch, and he immediately says, You know, it reminds me of a story. You see, and I'm just going to do a quick little rendition. There was this beautiful little town. It was kind of in a valley, in the mountains and whatnot. And you know, Spring, beautiful, summer, wonderful, fall. Ah, there was that impending winter. And the winter would come the floods. Every winter. So it goes in this whole story with the village getting flooded. But you know what happened? Eventually the townspeople said, you know, it's gonna flood every winter. We gotta find a way to I know, we'll be Venice. Let's have gondolas. And so it paints this whole other variation of what this flooding can look like and how you can use the water. It'd be a fun thing. And they're looking at it. Because if you ever watch a, an Erickson tape, you are in an altered state within 31.2 seconds. You're like, I don't know if any of you have been hypnotized. It's a whole other thing. But anyway, but you don't know it's another thing. That's what's so amazing about it. Your hand's suddenly up here. You have no idea why it's up there. What are you doing up there? Come down. No, why not? So what brought you here again? Uh, I don't remember. And they leave in, in marital bliss, supposedly. So if you change it in the metaphor, theoretically the self changes it in the practical. So I had this client. I was seeing this kid. His dad, rigid ex-Navy man, whose face kind of looked like a hawk or an eagle. Kind of intimidating. Calls me. He says, look, we have a foster kid. I'm hitting him. It's not OK. I know you have to report. I've already reported. I've told him to take the kid out. But more importantly, this isn't OK with me. I, I, I got I to work. You don't see my kid anymore. I like you. Can I see you? Because well, first you got to ask the kid in case he ever comes back as a teenager. It's like, no, that's fine. This guy was amazing in his ability to do imagery. Amazing. You'd never think it, but he would just go into this state and see it in the most exquisite detail. So we did lots of imagery. So one of the images, he can get to listen to how we, people talk. He said, I carried a lot. I have a lot of garbage from my past. I mean, a lot of garbage. So what might you do? I mean, again, I'm racing way ahead. What might you do if somebody said something like that? And you're an image, an old Jungian-ish kind of therapist. Mm -hmm. See the garbage. What are you seeing? He says, oh, you know, I see big bags. It's like, the, and it's like those big black bags of garbage. And there's like this big pile. And in white tape, it says, mom. He was so proud. Big dad. Little one, brother. Again, fast forward. What do you want to do with this garbage? What do you think I want to do with it? Take it to the dump. See yourself. See, see it be taken. I thought it was going to be a big trash crack. No, he wanted to drive it personally to the dump. And he did the most wonderful reparenting of himself. By the way, the, we'll call her now wave dancer. She did fabulous reparentings. She got custody of her inner child. She saw her child. She went to court. She called CPS. She told the dad, you will never touch this kid ever again. This is over a span of 20 sessions. Eventually, she ends up, this is all in the image world, each session, in court, getting custody. As the child's walking out with her hand in hand, this really struck me. I said, how's the child feeling? She said, scared, because she's scared about her sister being left at home. I said, do you tell her you're going to get the sister, too? 
And she said, but I feel guilty. She feels guilty that the, the mom will be alone. Yeah, and we did this whole, but it's so real that the actual feeling you'd actually have in the real thing, and actually, but she did this marvelous elaborate. One of the days was her birthday. Give her from morning through night the perfect birthday. Do all this. Okay. Back to my stern one. I happened to cut my finger. I was about to see him, so I was racing. And I wasn't, you know, I was bleeding. I was like, ah, oh, dang it. Oh, I know. This sounds insane, but crazy loop on skin. They always warn you. I thought this will be easy. Just a little drop, boom. Hey, it works. There's a point to this. Had a little bandage. Then what happened? I said, yeah, I've got a little cut. But you know, I used a little crazy glue and it works. It's probably toxic, but hey. <laughs> so if I fall over, you'll know why. It's the crazy glue. Session, talking, blah, blah, blah. My heart is broken. What do you do? Open heart surgery. Of course, we've got to heal your heart. So what are you seeing? And you know, open, blah, 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 blah. And then he came up with, oh, weird, what? They're using crazy glue to heal the broken heart. We sews it. This is in great detail, though. And then his family comes in for the recovery and his wife. And, are you getting this? Meet Titan Kinimaka. This is, I don't know if you can see it. Might as well get the good shot. Sorry. Titan Kinimaka. And this is the situation that happened. So Titan Kinimaka is a Hawaiian, native Hawaiian big wave rider. He was riding Waimea Bay. He fell off. Yes, even Titan falls off sometimes. And he broke his femur. It stuck out. Oh, agony. Here is a dear man in agony being rescued. He had a treatment regime. And one of the things good old Titan did was, right after I woke up in the morning, I would go into this state. I would focus on the pain, and the pain would take me into an out-of-body state. I would go through all this light with all these different colors shooting by, and I ended up on the other side of the light. I was in a garden-like place, and I came up to this plantation-style house, and there was a big fish pond full of lilies, frogs, and swans. There was a beautiful willow tree hanging down in front of the house, and I'd walk up to the deck, a big wide deck with oiled floors, and there was beveled glass on the doors and windows. It was just like a beautiful place to be, and the whole time I was there, I felt no pain in my body. At the same time, if I looked back over my shoulder, I could see myself lying in bed in the hospital, and if I turned and looked back, at the house and garden, I felt no pain in my body. Every day I would do this for about an hour and a half. I understood that I had tapped into some sort of ancient mind traveling thing. I realized that this must be some kind of energy to tap into when we need it. Thank you, Titan. Or is it Titus? Is it Titan or Titus? Titus, not Titan. Sorry, your name is Titus. That's why you're looking like that. Dude, my name is Titus, not Titan. Sorry. A guy named Symington runs the Symington Institute. His, early on in his career, he had a patient who had inoperable cancer. And again, to way oversimplify, he had this patient imagine white wolves eating rotten hamburger. And as this client did that religiously on a daily basis, the tumors went down. Again, many intervening variables are possible. The white wolves represent the white blood cells and the rotting hamburger, the cancerous cells. So he based among, he doesn't say only do this, but among other things, he has, of course, his patients imagine the tumors or whatever in various forms and imagine white blood cells and otherwise attacking. And now he also has family members and friends do the imagery with the people. Okay. No, no. Mm -hmm. First, he was on uh, antibiotics. We did that in the hospital. We just sat and thought about him overcoming the pain yes. and, and the infection going away. And he said it made him feel better. Yes. <laughs> we, will, we will, by the way, before we end today, we'll get into the wooga wooga aspects of Jung. 
because it does move to that place. That's one of the other criticisms of Jung is that these guys are too weird and mystic and crazy and bizarre. His books, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, has some pretty unusual stuff in it. Okay, but you get some sense of problem solving. Actually, I realized the guy, the um, stockbroker, that was kind of an image used in problem solving kind of thing. I want you to imagine. Now we're going to move into the archetypal imageries. I want you to imagine a boat. I want you to imagine a boat. See where the boat is. Take a look at that boat. Look at the time of day or night, kind of the weather. Perfect. Somebody tell us if they're willing to share what they saw. What boat? What are you seeing? Jan, what are you seeing? I'm so sorry. I was taking notes. Oh, that's OK. That's all right. Well, will somebody else is describing see a boat. OK. I see my grandpa's boat. Ah. Beautiful. So that would be both a personal and a transpersonal image. That's neat you can find. Ray, my man, what are you seeing? Um, it's at nighttime. Uh, beautiful sky full of stars. Um, it's just me and myself on this little raft, just floating and enjoying life in space. Perfect. One other, one other boat. Small boat, the water is still, it's a sunny day. Warm, and there's a lighthouse nearby to provide protection. Ah, why? Is there somebody that lives in that lighthouse? Or is it? Yes. Yeah. Ah, who lives in the lighthouse? The lighthouse keeper is white. Ah. Okay. In fact, we could go into all of that, but that's fine. So a boat is an archetypal symbol. And water and ocean and all of that is archetypal. So is a lighthouse, a guy. I mean, you just, you see how it just starts? This is like play therapy of the mind. It's the same place, ladies and gentlemen. The good news is it stays with you wherever you go. And as you develop, it doesn't go away. It's just we add all these other parts. It's right there. You are on a trail somewhere, OK? Describe for us where this trail is. Two mountains in the distance, grass on each side. Okay. Trail. Do a trip. Perfect. Okay. What time of day? What are we doing? Day. Uh, midday. Midday. Sun. Okay. So you're walking. I want you to notice. I don't know if it's on your right side, left side, where it is. There's like a little cottage, a little hut, some little building structure. As you see it, describe for us what you're seeing. It's old. Right. Um, Yeah, the glass. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one of the little corners is broken through. Okay. Um, has a small two step. Okay. In this, and you kind of know this, but you kind of don't, you know what you're. In this cottage lives an old man who has lived a very full life. Okay? And you get the sense that he wants you to come up to the cottage and knock, and he'll, he'll greet you. Okay? And, then, and have you come in. What are you seeing? What's this man like? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, full, white, beard. Yeah. Uh, time took its toll on him. Oh, yeah. He's lived a life. You see it on his skin. See, it, it, he looks kind of like us. He looks the, he's wearing clothes, but not necessarily like freshly pressed. <laughs> not necessarily freshly <laughs> pressed. <laughs> no, it's like a dry that. cleaner around there. Yeah. But he has wisdom, and he yeah. has something to share with you. If it's OK with you, tell us what it is he's told you. Walk your own path. Walk your own path. Bam! Bam! 
You could write that and put that on your, by your mirror someplace you see. So what archetype is that? The what? Journey. Both the journey and what's the man? Maybe I didn't tell you about it. Yes, the wise old man. There's the wise old woman. The wise old man is an archetype of that wise part of us, the wise one. We all have it. <laughs> it's obviously an aspect of yourself. In her White House, it's a consultant. It's not a consultant because he lives there. But we can move there. We can just move into that zone if we choose to. And I know who's got the time. But once you start establishing a relationship with these parts, they'll just come to you. It, you don't have to. You'll just like, you'll be in a situation and you'll suddenly see the wise one say, oh, by the way, I think it might be useful to do this. Thank you. You say that silently, by the way. Again, if you're in front of your dissertation committee. Okay? Archetypes abound. You just have to keep track, but you have to, it's all about relating to these symbols. Okay. There was a well known psychologist whose name escapes me who wrote a one page statement to a well known journal, peer reviewed journal, and said the following. Since you all know me, I want you to know something of this effect. Since you all know me, I want you to know this truth. You all know me as a research psychologist. My work has been widely published, many books, blah, 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 blah. This is my truth. I was driving on the LA freeway around midday when suddenly, to my left, came a green VW bus and the sole passenger, the driver, the driver, was a graduate school colleague I had not seen in 20 years. I was thrilled. He looked at me, immediately recognized me, he waves, I wave at him. Do you know where this is going? I wave at him and then I say, I indicate, you know, the freeway off ramp, let's go. I'm so excited. I get off the off ramp, I look, it's vanished. It was just, that was just so strange. Hmm. Now are you knowing where this is going? Okay, that's where it's going. About six months later, lo and behold, there's a reunion of that graduate class. And he can't wait to go. I forget the guy's name. We'll call him Jack. Because Jack's going to be there, you know? So he's there. He's, he's like, hey, where, where's Jack, man? And what do they say? Dead. Of course they say he's dead. They all turn sheep white and they go, well, didn't you hear Jack died? What? No. I just saw him like six months ago. He died years ago. What are you talking about? I just saw him on the freeway six months ago, three months ago, whatever. You know the weird thing? Remember how Jack always drove Peugeot's? Remember I used to give him, sh actually it was Jaguars, I always gave him shit about the Jaguars and he said, yeah, you know, the cylinders always get on timing this time, but when they're great, there's no better ride, blah, blah, blah. This, this wasn't a Jag. And they go, not only did you not know that he died, you didn't hear how he died. How did he die? Well, he took his Jag to the shop to get worked on. And they gave him a loner car, and you totally know where this is going. They gave him a loner car, and he was on the freeway, LA freeway, and bam, smashed into a truck, was instantly killed. And of course, what was the loner car? Should we say it all together? Green VW bus. Make of it what you will, this is my truth. Sincerely, whatever the famous guy's name is. Okay? By the way, if you haven't figured it out, this is the wooga wooga section of the Jung Spiel. <laughs> <laughs> that client that I keep talking about, the wave dancer, went to psychics, among other things. She had two psychics, and one was a dear friend of hers. He was a grad student in clinical psychology, not at Alliance, some other school. He was in a hypno hypnosis class. And they asked for a volunteer. He went right up there, sat right down, went right into trance. 
And they did the hand thing and some other things. Again, have you, have you been, have ever been in trance? I, you were, you mean. I was once in the, uh, I was a teenager and it was actually the Wincy Surf Club had this thing and they had Dr. Dean come up, who was a famous <laughs> hypnotist. And I, we had us all sit, I'll never forget it. And you close your eyes and then he said, for those of you who can open your eyes, you can leave the stage, for the rest you stay. <laughs> I'm like, this is ridiculous, of course I can, of course I can, huh? I could not open my eyes. It was the weirdest feeling, because I thought, I'm not in a trance, because there was nothing, you know, I wasn't in some faraway plantation house, or, I'm just right here, I know exactly. With all these peers I'm trying to impress, you know, I, I, but I can't open my eyes for the life of me, weirdest thing. And then he says, oh, okay, look who's left. I'm thinking, who's left? I can't see. <laughs> I'm wondering who's left, but I can't open my eyes to know. It's like, he goes, all right, well, I tell you what, for those who cannot get up from their chair, we're going to do some interesting things. And I thought, oh, fuck, he's going to have me do the funky chink in front of all this. <laughs> I am not doing this. I'm getting up. And sure enough, I got up immediately, my eyes open. I'm like, whoo. And sure enough, he had actually had them pretend they're surfing pipeline. In their mind, they are surfing pipeline. But everyone's cracking up. It's an amazing state. And what it is basically is you distract the prefrontal cortex. It's not that I'm not in charge. Of course I'm in charge of my eyes. But the part of me that's in charge of keeping the eyes closed is in fact in charge in the Oval White House going, nope, you're not closing your eyes. Yeah, your hand's going to stay up there. And the part that's saying, oh, but put it down, the conscious part is distracted, disengaged. So this grad student is up there and he's doing these various things and then the professor says, you know, okay, or the hypnotist, yeah, I guess the prophet's doing the hypnosis, says, um, okay, thank you very much, wonderful, class, you ready? Go ahead and come out of trance. And the guy says, well, there's a spirit up in the corner of the room, and it wants to come into me and talk to the class, if that's okay. Class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot what his name is. Uh, God, I think it's Robert. We'll call him Robert. Robert? Okay with me. Look! Hello! I don't know why they all, and I'm sorry, I do a terrible brogue. I mean, I won't even embarrass myself, never mind bother you with it. But of course, they, the name is like Ekta, some weird name. I mean, what? Come on! Can't it be just like Bob? Hi, I'm Bob, and I talk like a normal person. No, it's got to have this little accent, or whatever it is. And yep, we're spirits, we're all over the place. Yeah, there's some mean ones, but we're a lot of good ones. We want to help, and yeah, we know everything that's going on, and blah, 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 all that stuff, man, all that stuff. The teacher's like, okay, fine, if the, tell the class something that there's no way Robert would know. You sure you want me to do that? Yeah, so of course she tells some dark secret, and the guy's four shades of chartreuse, and like, oh my God. Ictha didn't want to leave Robert. This was really nice. He finally had a way, a speaker, a way to voice, an iPod to play his tune. Robert has no longer had to quit grad school and he became a psychic. They had to share the mainframe. Yeah, wouldn't leave. Wouldn't leave. And he's a very good psychic. And he, he gets to be Robert and he gets to be a son. By the way, I once did a, an evaluation of a guy in jail, local jail. And he <laughs> said he was haunted by this big bird-like thing. And I was trying to give him <laughs> the Rorschach and whatnot. And I, he kept looking at the bird. I said, look, forget it. I'm, first of all, let me be clear. Bird, come here. By the way, there's a, there's a window so the people are watching. Bird, get up. Is the bird here? Yeah. Do you notice, and this is one of those creative realities, do you notice that I'm taller than the bird? I didn't say, is, is, I didn't ask the question. I made the statement. I'm telling the bird. He goes, yeah. I said, good. Nice bird. I'm telling the bird to sit down. Bird's sitting down, right? Yeah, thank you. What does the bird see? And I gave the bird the roar shot. <laughs> Maybe it's a spirit. I don't know. Ikta. Psyche. Okay. When I've said, oh, I was in, um, when I did my, my uh, UC Davis, the Carl Tate, the UC Davis experience, we would have, every three months, somebody come and spiel to us. There was a very famous Bay Area psychic. The Bay Area is full of psychics. <laughs> Everywhere is a psychic in the Bay Area. <laughs> Find them all in the street corners. Anyway, Nancy Tuppy was her name. And she talked about the transformation of becoming a psychic. She was a plain old professional woman who started having visions and stuff, and she went to her husband and said, 
one of two things. Either I'm going psychotic and you're going to have to hospitalize me, or I'm transforming into something else because I hear voices, I hear things, but it's not really voices, but I'm getting premonitions and all, anyway, and I don't know what to do. And he says, I'll support you in whatever you want to do. She says, I'm going to go through the dark sea journey and find out what's on the other end. And she did, and she became a big deal psychic. And she did mostly readings. You give her, I gave her the word home. I just said, home, what do you see? <laughs> and she did this whole thing on it. Um, she once was at a, in a workshop, and there was a pool, a big Olympic-sized swimming pool, and somebody lost their contact lens. She said, oh, you can find it. She goes, well, I'm not really a finder type psychic, but I'll give it a go. And sure enough, she found, the, you know, pointed away, and they looked, and somehow they were able to see the little contact lens at the bottom of the pool. Now, you can do statistics and look at the square foot, you know, you can... Synchronicity, meaningful coincidence. That's a very deep Jung concept. Jung was very comfortable with all this because, of course, he believes the collective unconscious has the, there's no time, has all the wisdom of all the ages, past, future, present, whatever. Now, as you know, I am no physicist, but there is this, what is that, the Boggs, oh God, Higgins, Higgins Boss discovery. Oh, it's a very important discovery in physics. It's an energy field force, whatever, that explains a lot. It was always hypothesized, and now they've somehow proven it exists. It's this energy force. Energy I just, force. what is it? <laughs> no, I'm just up here, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and then there's this other one I just saw it in time about the universe. Is, there's all this antimatter. There's this stuff out there. So maybe, I don't know, maybe somehow psychic phenomena, I believe, it, it must involve mirror neurons, and maybe because, let's take Sharon McGoldrick. My best buddy, you've all heard about Joey, Joe McGoldrick, his wife. Joe was on a, she went, supposedly went golfing. He was going golfing. Sorry, you have to leave, it's okay. There's some good stories you're gonna miss, but that's all right. I'll watch it. Good, watch the end of it, watch the end. You'll enjoy this. So, unbeknownst to Sharon, totally, Joe went to the golf thing, but then somebody had a boat, so they went out fishing. And Joe, in fact, ended up, if you take a line from where they live and went straight out in the ocean, that's exactly where he ended up. Sharon was taking a nap. She suddenly gets up and feels nauseously seasick. Nauseously seasick. And she looks at the clock, it's about 2 o'clock, and of course, meaningful coincidence or otherwise, because she doesn't normally get seasick at any time of my middle of the day on a Sunday, just happened that Joey was on that boat, totally seasick, barfing over the boat at 2 o'clock. Meaningful coincidence. Sharon, Joe, and his mom, Floss, all went out to dinner. Had a very nice dinner. They come home, they drop Floss off, Sharon has a dream. Sharon, by the way, has psychic-ish kind of tendencies. You have psychic tendencies. The dream floss comes to her and says, kneels by the bed, it says, I just want you to know I'm fine. I'm fine. And just take great care of Joey. You all know what happened. Sharon wakes up. Joey wakes up that morning. They get a phone call from his sister. And Floss died that night. Now, we don't have the exact time enough to know that that dream happened at the exact time. Sharon's never had a dream like that before. Never had a dream like that since. By the way, on a lighter note, so I'm doing this custody eval. And, <laughs> it, yeah, well, it is compared to, come on, Floss is death, come on. Custody of Al's, I, to me, that's a really lighter note. As I always say, it's not pediatric oncology. That's a, you know, people say, oh my God, how do you do those? I didn't take it seriously, but it's not. Here's this very professional doctor. And, but he's also a musician, he's an interesting guy. 
But when you're doing custody valve, it's kind of like taking a driver's test, only for your kids, not your license. So you do the, actually now I guess it's three. You're not supposed to do the two and ten. Right, because it's, it's the airbag. I think you're supposed to be now three and nine or whatever it is. But in any event, um, he says, I said, you know, because he was trying, I said, do you ever have any unusual experience? He goes, well, as a matter of fact, I got really interested in out-of-body experiences. Titus was talking about. And so I started practicing that. I'd lie in bed, and I'd, I got to the point where I could kind of see myself. I'd look down at myself, sleep be, being in bed. And it was kind of cool. And then I'd come back, home base. But one night I thought, you know, I wonder how far I can take this. And I heard some noise in the kitchen. And it was late. I woke up, and it's like 2 and nine. So I thought, well, I wonder if I can travel to the kitchen. He says, you know the weirdest thing? You can't just like go through walls. No, I had to do it rat style. I had to go like under the little door thing. I like made my spirit really thin and then whoop, came back up. And I'm in the kitchen. There's my mom who happened to be visiting me at the time. And she's eating some cereal and whatnot. And I'm thinking, wow, what the heck my, is my mom doing up and huh? And then I thought, oh my God, I've never been this far away from my body. I wonder if I can make it back. And I did. But I had to go through the door frame again. I couldn't just go through the walls. And of course, you know, he wakes up that morning and of course there's cereal stuff and his mom can say, oh, I couldn't sleep and went and ate cereal. Now, maybe those sounds woke him up. Who knows? But, so I had a student when I was doing all this say, you know, my grandfather died and we went to his house and when we came out there was this huge grasshopper on the car. And then when we went to the burial site, all of a sudden there were these grasshoppers and there were grasshoppers around. Now, of course, they're Asian, and by the way, of course, his, I mean, so cliche, but his name or symbol, whatever, was grasshopper, of course. So they took his ashes and they put it in this bronze grasshopper thing. Now, I've had Native Americans in this class. I've had Hispanics. To them, it's kind of like saying, whoa, blue sky. Can you believe it? I mean, wow, it's, it's blue. I don't know how it's blue exactly. I think we figured it out, but you can Google it. But it is blue. Because it's so every day. It's so like, they have shamans. They live in that world. Kids live in that world. Any of you had any of these kinds of things? Please. One time ago when I first came to California, I was here um, in the town of San Diego area. My mother was in the East Coast. I had a job that the company had some equipment on the top of one of the tallest mountains in San Diego. And so my job was to take this rickety old truck and drive to the top of that mountain, which I had never done before, was completely unfamiliar with. It's a very narrow dirt road, no guardrails, literally. Oh, God. <laughs> one wrong turn, <laughs> you know, careening off the cliff to a certain depth. Right. And so this was quite a white knuckle experience to drive to the top of this thing and back down. So the next day, my mother calls me and said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Why? She said, I had this weird dream. And she proceeded to recount to me in complete detail everything that happened. Right. Right. Go figure. Yeah. In great detail. My mom was very bright. My mom was one of the termites. The termin study of a thousand brightest kids in California. There's still records of her at Stanford. They would give her questionnaires till basically the day she died. And a very, very thorough longitudinal study. She loved to read. But she was bored by what they read in school. So she would notice whenever she would think about the teacher, he would always call on her. Ah. And so she thought, oh, I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call him to call on me. I'll answer the question, and then I'll get to read what I want to read. And she said, you know, I was unbelievably good at it. And then one time, and she was about, she said, you know, I was around a teenager or something. Something came to me. I don't remember what it was, but all I said was, no, I don't want you in my life. Go away. And it never came back. But she thought, she said, it was something from the non-natural world. And she didn't, she was very scientific. She didn't, you know, she, she was the one who turned me on to Jung, so she was open that way. But she, and that's interesting. It's interesting we talk about Nancy Tuppy. It's a choice for some folks about do I allow, even with the hypnosis thing, do I allow this in or not? 
Let me tell you one from my own life. So my dear mom, who was getting older, my dad had passed and was living in the Muellen's home where my dear friends now live so that Duran looks at the same roof when he spends a night there as I did when I was a teenager. I love that. And it was time to look at other living arrangements. My dear wife, thank you, Rory Devine, bless you, said, she's living with us. I'm like, really, you sure? Absolutely. I have no other way. God, I'm being teary. I just had that thought. Thank you, my dear. So we're getting her already, blah, blah, blah. It's a long process. I mean, there's 50 years of a life in that home and boxes and blah, 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 blah. So she'd stay up there and stuff. She calls me and says, oh, let me back up. When, she was, when I was about 16, she had some kind of, she was sick. And in those days, good old John Welsh, who was the doctor in town, would actually make house calls. So I remember he came over, and I was like, Ugh, I was scared, I was nervous. And I remember kind of standing by the door listening. And I remember him asking her, have you, so how many, you know, you know, have you had any other births? And she said, yeah, I had two. And I was shocked. I never heard anything about, did I come out twice? I mean, literally, I was trying to figure this out. Well, I remember her telling me, you know, I have things about my life prior to meeting your dad and all that that I can tell you about. She was Steinbeck's right-hand person. She lived a very interesting life. But in any event, she said, years later, when I come back from college, you know, I was chatting and said, you know, I once had a daughter. What? What? You had a daughter? Yes, I was married before. I mean, this whole life, like, who are you? You had life before me? Like about benign narcissist. What? But yeah, she had a daughter named Kay. And Kay died at age 12 of a brain tumor. And that's when she met my dad about then. He would met Kay. They were all in Monterey. She was with Steinbeck. She lived with this guy named Matt Ricketts, who was Steinbeck's best friend, who's Doc and Cannon Row. It's this whole, like, wow, whoa, OK, OK. So I knew about Kay and whatnot. Fast forward, sorry, back to, she calls me, says, honey, I was cleaning out the house and all that, and you, you won't believe this. I found a poem that Kay wrote when she was eight years old, and I want to read it to you. I am a little wave with white shoes and a dress with lace. I go and I come forever and forever. I, and to this day, every time I say that poem, I am more than stunned. I just went silent, I just went. You look at my room when I was 16, I told you, you want a towel, there's so many waves. This is the most powerful symbol in my life. I am a wave, oh my God. It's like, oh my God, I'm wearing my sister. This, wow, it just blows me away to this moment. It, no. Meaningful coincidence ah, blows me away. I am a And the line about, and I go and I come, instead of I come and I go, because she left, but then she keeps coming back. It's like she was eight years old, so I have this picture of her. With a white, God, that's so powerful for whatever reason. With white shoes and this dress of lace, and I put the poem right under it, the actual poem. Kay was born, as I found out a few years after that incident, on November 3rd, 1935. Now, the first time we met, one of the things I told you was, Joey, my best friend, his birthday is November 3rd. And when I saw that, I called him and went, you're my sister. You're not only my brother, you're my sister. <laughs> He's like, huh? I said, my sister Kay, she was born on November 3rd. Now, I know it's 1 in 365th probability, but come on, November 3rd. 
So I went over to his house and I hugged him. Said, Kay, you're my sister. <laughs> Kay? As, as far as these things being you know, therapeutic, I know there's studies on like, psychedelics and MDMA and DMT. What do you think about those types of therapies that basically kind of induce or facilitate a more supernatural? Again, within the context of a rela safe and sheltered space mm -hmm. and a relationship. And you also, and by the way, Jung was also very aware of ego. I mean, you've got to be able to contain this stuff. I, I, you know, it's exploration. We're about exploring. You can think, feel, say anything, and I can help you on this journey as a co-guide to whatever the metaphor or reality or whatever it is. We're a fabulous species that can experience amazing things that our prefrontal logic mind cannot yet explain. I think, if nothing else, that attitude is important. Because your clients, some of them, particularly kids, are going to come to you with some pretty weird stuff if you really give them a safe and sheltered space. And are they crazy, or are they psychic, or I, I don't know. I had one guy who felt he was haunted. Is it a metaphor? Is it a reality? He kept losing things, and you never could find him. He'd go and camp out, and he knew he had the the flashlight, but then disappear, you know, then on the way back, you know? It wasn't just he misplaced it. And then I started losing things. It's like, it's like rubbing off, I don't know. But to be open to their reality, this, what if the Stepford wife came to you? Is she psychotic? Or is, I asked actually my supervisor, Tom Morrison, at the time. I said, well, I want to see the Rorschach, I want to see the MMPI, I want to see, you know, the data. What's the difference between being psychic and being psychotic? There's a lot out there. And if you move into magic mind, you open into a lot of possibilities. And being open is, I think, very useful. Go have meaningful coincidences out in the world this week. I'll see you next week.